So we're Mikhail Riches, I'm David, that's Anneli. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight in the absence of Rowan Moore um, with some difficulty because we were going to have a conversation with him, but instead we're going to um, just prattle on for as long as we can um, and see what happens. Um, so for us, it really started when we were running a practice called RHM, Annalie and I, with Kathy Hawley, our third partner, um, back in 2005, where we were absolutely thrilled to be shortlisted for an RIBA competition called Clayfield in Suffolk. And what was really remarkable about this competition was the extent of commitment from the client to what are now called green issues. The, the, the client was in, hugely assisted by a, a local architect called Ralph Carpenter, who had made a bit of a name for himself using hempcrete. And as a client, they were looking, together with um, the, uh, the, the um, the local authority, sorry, Andy, correct me, was it Elmswell Parish Council and... Um, Mid-Suffolk District Council. Mid-Suffolk District Council. As so I do this bit. <laughs> yeah, you should do this bit. Um, as a client, they're looking for a housing scheme that would demonstrate that it was possible to do rural housing in a contemporary way that was also very sustainable. Um, and when we met the clients, and their representatives, it was very clear there was a huge local need for housing. This is two hours away from London. Housing had become unaffordable. Um, and it was really the beginning of, I think, of our low carbon education, if you like, as architects. Annalee had previously done some really interesting work with Timber Frame on her own house. Um, but I think it was the focus of this competitive process with a client who really raised the agenda, uh, raised the bar for us uh, with their aspirations for what they called a deep green solution to rural housing. So it starts in 2005, and I'm not going to talk too much about this other than it became for us a test bed for ideas that were later seen at Goldsmith Street. So it has a relevance to the trajectory of our work. It took a lot of tracing paper to arrive at the solution we did for the site, which, um, which was based around various conversations we'd had with Burra Hapold, our sustainability experts. And, you know, we were saying, if we want to do something that's affordable, this is all social housing, in an area which obviously isn't London, therefore values aren't that great, what should we do? And their advice was, amongst other things, to try as much as possible to face the housing south and to try and harness the energy, the free energy from the sun. Um, and to do that in such a way as to make a great place is not necessarily easy because, you know, cities aren't made from lots of buildings looking south, are they? So we eventually alighted on a site plan and a site strategy that arranged buildings um, into kind of almost contemporary barns. So each one of those barns is housing three terraced houses. It's a terrace of three, which are then shifted with respect to each other. So they try and avoid as much as possible overshadowing each other when you're looking to try and harness winter sun. And those groups of six houses in terraces of three are then shifted and pulled around the site so that we're trying to then make significant um, external landscapes. And I think this is a theme then which you'll find is running through all our work, which is not just sustainability, but social sustainability as well. How do you make a place which is likely to lead to social interaction, where people can make friends, where mums and dads can watch their children play easily? Um, and where you can grow things communally. So top right is a wildflower meadow, which was due to be um, mown once a year. Um, 
here is a an allotment area for community growing and right at the heart of the scheme overlooking the drained and reseeded football pitch is a small children's play area and so there are two broad themes to our work which i think are almost apparent here which is a desire for a, a, a low carbon an interest in low carbon building but also an interest in a kind of social connectedness is that possible to do with housing and this is a view of that <clears throat> when it was built in 2009 um, so the buildings use um, some really interesting techniques so uh, it's a prefabricated timber frame um, sprayed with hempcrete insulation from the outside in and then um, various techniques for finishing the buildings were um, using one was using a, a, a lime washed lime render directly onto the hempcrete um, another one was to use a timber cladding, uh, western red cedar cladding, and then a series of roofs made of uh, western red cedar shingles. Um, and, you know, I think it's fair to say we were thrilled with it. Um, it was 26 homes, or the majority was socially rented, there were a few shared ownership. And our client, um, Orwell Housing Association, um, were uh, thrilled with it too. But I think what really happened and what makes this incredibly unusual was that we were lucky enough to be the recipients of a post-occupancy analysis conducted by not us or the client, but by Bura Happel, the engineers. Um, they put a PhD student of theirs on it for two years. Um, and so we may never have learned any lessons from this project, like so many architects who finish projects they're kind of proud of, but don't really know how they work. Um, we were able to get some very interesting feedback from residents. Lots of things that we'd hoped would work, like the district heating, uh, the biomass boiler fueled by wood chips from the local Fetford forest. Lots of those things kind of worked, but weren't necessarily as uh, successful as we'd hoped, certainly as the engineers had hoped. Um, for example, there was quite a lot of heat loss discovered on the um, subterranean district heating system, which isn't ideal. But one thing that came across loud and clear was that the decision to face everything south had massively influenced the fuel bills of residents. Um, so, you know, whilst it was a bit of a mixed picture in terms of feedback, I think we were able to take that, that learning and start applying it to our future projects. And it was just about in 2009 that we were shortlisted for the next significant RIBA competition, which was for Goldsmith Street in Norwich. Um, and I'll just dwell on this for a bit. Some of you may know Norwich. There's a city centre. Um, and our site is dotted in red here. So the city wall, I think, is pretty much on that line there. And that's a pretty major ring road. So our site, Goldsmith Street, is about 10 minutes walk from the city centre. So very walkable. Um, and not car reliant, which again, you know, isn't quite unusual. We were tasked in the brief with trying to provide dwellings at about 85 per hectare, which was substantially denser than we were used to, certainly much denser than the, um, the clay field scheme. And we were looking for ways of providing a kind of gentle density where, you know, one isn't reliant on flats, but actually we're looking to try and provide houses as well as flats. And in casting our net, looking at the locality, we came across 
the so-called Golden Triangle of Norwich, which, uh, if I go back, is just over the road, and this area here, shown slightly darker. And Cathy, who's from Norwich, knew that this area was very desirable. Lots of people, like the local MP, lived there, and university lecturers, and what have you. Um, so we started looking at it in a bit more detail. And you can see here, it's Edwardian red brick streets. And interestingly, both the spacing of the terraces across the road, but also at the back, is approximately 14 meters, which is much, much lower than, you know, planning guidance would suggest you should be building 18 to 22 meters. I'm sure many of you know that's known as the overlooking distance that we all have to subscribe to. Anneli, you've got quite a good story about where this comes from, haven't you, which I'm sure you'll share with everyone later. Um, but it seemed to us relatively arbitrary. And like here was housing just over the road, which everybody wants to live in, um, and yet it conflicts with planning legislation. So we took a bit of a punt in the competition and um, looked at how we could potentially arrange housing in the form of houses and flats at that kind of separation, 14 meters. The site lent itself to four terraces separated at 14 meters, um, but with quite a lot of bespoke architectural design. So, for example, um, houses are quite unusually shallow in their depth and therefore quite wide in their width. So they're about six meters wide and about eight meters deep. Most house builders will be doing houses of about 4.5 width by about 10 meters deep. Um, so we had to find a way of unpacking the kind of anatomy of a street to make streets that would fit with the site. Um, so just to take you through the site layout, there's a series of back garden fences at the top, which form the edge of our site. Um, series of little four-story towers here and here and here. Um, again here, so local authority post-war housing. But there is a number of you know, streets around. So our aspiration was to try and breathe back the idea of streets to the, the part of Norwich which had pretty well been decimated by post-war planning with point blocks, cul-de-sacs, you know, dead-end roads. Uh, and instead, we were interested in how to create kind of streets and connectivity akin to the kind of simplicity, if you like, of the Golden Triangle. So we have um, a series of terraced houses which are terminated by flats on the end, which are thought of as big houses, if you like. Um, and there's quite a substantial amount of external amenity space in the form of landscape or shared gardens. Small, small children's play area up here, a kind of uh, gentle pedestrian route through between the terraces here, and a much larger area of park here and here. Um, they were kind of outside of our site boundary, but, but this wasn't. So we had the choice to build here if we wanted to, but we chose not to. Um, so what lay behind the idea of streets was a desire for kind of legibility. You know, if, you're, if you were a visitor, it would be clear to you where you go. Um, but also this idea taken from the success of Clay Field was how do we make this a truly low carbon neighborhood? It's got you know, an emphasis on bikes and pedestrians, great. We're 10 min minutes away from town centre. That's an accident, we can't help that, but we're lucky to have it. Um, so that meant that car numbers could be reduced and the client and, and the local authority looked at 0 0.7 cars per dwelling, which is very low um, in, outside of London. 
Um, and the other thing we could do is try and encourage that southerly aspect. And to that, to that extent, we also looked at, you know, the distance of 14 meters. How can we ensure that even on the shortest day of the year, the winter sun would penetrate? And so we started drawing 15 degree angles, which represent the solstice sun, sun angle, um, the winter solstice, and just ensured through 3D modeling that we would be able to get sunlight into the ground floor rooms. So it's a solar scheme, much like Clayfield, um, but it's also a scheme that looks to re-stitch a bit of city back together. So the client then came back to us many years later after the scheme had fallen asleep for three or four years. Um, I think it was to do with a crash. Um, and said, good news, we're going to actually do your scheme um, and would you possibly consider doing it as a passive house scheme? Um, and at that stage, I think I'd read a few articles about passive house and I had a kind of prejudice um, about, you know, everything. And my prejudice was this, uh, and it was wrong. The prejudice was, you can have windows to the south, but woe betide you if you have windows to the north. Um, and that filled me with fear, because how do you make a great place if there are no windows on the north side? Or you've got a street that's so asymmetrical that it feels really uncomfortable. So we started working with specialists, um, Sally uh, Gobber of Warm, um, who are based in Plymouth, and kind of unpack the whole passive house strategy thing. And what she said was, the great news, and again, we were relatively lucky, was that because you faced everything south, and your form factor is so good because you're in terraces, um, we're going to find it quite easy to make this passive house. It wasn't easy, but relatively so. And within the budget of a local authority providing social housing, you know, it, it had to be affordable. So that was the tension all the way through between affordability and ambition, um, which I can talk about forever and a day. But the principles of Passive House, for any of you that aren't familiar with it, is this. You try and minimise the heat requirement in the UK. You would minimise the heat requirement during the winter by ensuring that the envelope is incredibly well insulated. Um, and I'm not just talking about U values of walls, it's also about ensuring that um, the cold bridging around windows is dealt with. And so the consultant has to calculate the exact psi value of every little junction. So whenever you change anything as a designer, you have to go through the consultant and that makes it incredibly tortuous. Um, it makes a whole process you know, of change, the process of change then becomes very difficult to manage. So nonetheless, we, you know, we were keen to explore it. Um, the other thing that Passive House really helps you with is an understanding of thermal performance in the summer. So it works out for you where you've got the danger of overheating. Um, and I think one of the lessons we learned from Clay Field was that we hadn't really thought enough about that. And so in, in Norwich, we were providing south-facing windows with um, brie soleils, which cut out the high wind, summer sun, such as that. Um, the rest of it is about air, air tightness. So the red line here is um, your air tightness layer. And then number five is your whole house ventilation. So the internal environment is really, really well um, tempered, uh, fresh air, which is which is uh, pre-warmed by the air going out before it's pumped into the house. So that way you're, you're saving energy. And just a little detail here of the windows. Um, so the windows were calculated to be a certain size and they were smaller than we wanted. The walls were so much thicker than you would ever imagine at kind of 600 mil. So the design of the windows is about how you mediate between a massively thick window um, and the interior and the exterior. So this kind of chamfered reveal is all about 
this coffering, if you like, is about making the windows look bigger on the facade, but it's also, um, it, it's also about the way things look from the inside looking out, so you don't have a massive kind of castle-like reveal as you look out. And there you see the um, briselets at the top, and very simple, robust materials like, you know, brick, galvanized steel gutters, um, and the slates on the top, which are uh, a pantile, a glossy black pantile, which are a very local material to Suffolk uh, and Norwich. Uh, a, you see a lot of them around that area, and I believe it was due to the shipments of wool going over to her, the, the Netherlands and then coming back with ballast. And the ballast would be, you know, um, building materials often. So a very kind of Flemish uh, style of architecture exists in Norwich. We were thrilled when we found that this cost considerably less than the zinc standing seam roof that um, went out of tender. And OK, it's not just about choosing the materials. We worked very hard with a supplier to, um, to get specials made. So you see these, these, this roof detail here and the one at the top. Um, that's all about trying to lift the, the, the visual quality of the whole project through working collaboratively with a supplier called Crest. So the detail of public space is, is probably worth looking at. Um, I've talked to you about the small children's play area and the general arrangement of the streets. I think it's worth stressing that you know each terrace has a different condition. So the, the terrace at the top is entered from the south with a big three meter sunny south facing garden. And, and they were conceived of as spaces where you would um, potentially have people eating or having a beer of an evening. Um, as it happens, there's lots of kids out in their gardens with their toys as well. And they seem to really work. The north entered terrace is a very different condition. So here we've just provided a minimum strip of um, defensible planting and then no garden at all. They, by contrast, have a really great south facing back garden. So, you know, each side of the street has a different treatment. And there's a view looking down a typical street. So repetition being the name of the game because we're looking to both recreate streets but also trying to make it affordable. So there's nothing more repetitious than the Victorian street. Um, and there you see on the right-hand side the big house, which is three flats, um, one on top of the other. And the ginnel, um, which is the space, the shared landscape at the back of um, each garden, um, has been incredibly successful with sp especially toddlers and um, parents. Um, so parents can just leave their back gate open and know that their children are safe here. Um, the end of the ginnel is lockable, as you can see. So it's kind of safe shared space. And that's the central space looking through the middle. We're obsessed by bin stores and bike stores and uh, making sure that they're really robust. So this is a material um, expanded aluminium, which is three mil thick. So each one of these doors is purpose made in um, steel and aluminium. And uh, hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll last because, you know, so often you go around housing, which, which tends to be let down by bin stores hanging off at a funny angle. Um, so we got full, you know, our client, Norwich City Council, bought into the, 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 the important argument about longevity and value over time which is not easy to win with a local authority client, but we were lucky. Our client, Andrew Turnbull, was fabulous. And so he would go back to his superiors and make the argument for just that little bit more money to be spent on things that make a difference, such as the bin stores, the galvanized steel, um, rainwater goods, you know, etc. Anneli, I'm thinking that maybe I'm overdoing it, but... You can't see the drawings anyway. Flick through the drawings. Can't see them. Yeah, nobody can see that. Um, 
So there's a view of a typical two-story street with a dormer for a four-bedroom house. Generally, they're two-bedroom with um, the principal bedrooms facing south and the modelled roof, which allows for that winter sun to get in, means that the back of the houses are quite low. Um, and it's there that we have the bathrooms, a staircase and a landing, which people use for um, all kinds of things, such as sleepovers or study. But the ceiling's like 1.7 at the back. But it's still useful. It's a really nice thing to have in a house because, you know, it's space that maybe isn't particularly valued when you draw it, but actually it's become, especially during lockdown, I understand it was very, very valuable. Um, I said we were obsessed by bin, bin uh, gas meters and bin stores, and this is our gas and electricity meter cupboard um, either side of the front door. Shared front doors, paired front doors rather, not shared. Um, that's the flat at the end of the terrace. So I particularly like this typology. It's um, three one-bedroom flats, one above the other. Each one has its own front door onto the street. There's a third one around the side. Um, and therefore, you know, this is the front door to the ground floor flat. This is the front door to the first floor flat, which has a big balcony facing south. And this is the front door to the top floor flat, whose staircase scissors over the other staircase and then comes up to the top. So relatively efficient. Um, and there's the plan of it. So ground floor flat, um, big kitchen dining room onto the street and the back garden, their back garden, bedroom onto the back garden. So no bedrooms at ground floor level are, ever have windows on the public realm. Um, and instead, it's things like kitchen, dining rooms, or, or, or living rooms. Um, the yellow, if you could see it, takes you up to the top floor flat, and the blue takes you up to the first floor flat. I'm just going to briefly talk about what came next, because we're um, working with the city of York now on delivering 600 homes across seven sites. Um, we helped them put together their housing delivery program design manual just after we were appointed, which tries, as a local authority, they're trying to set out standard, not just for themselves to build to, but hopefully to developers and others in the city. So the ambition for them of the housing delivery program is not just about providing new housing, mixed tenure, um, some private sales, some socially rented, some affordable. Their ambition is also to try and use their clout to raise the bar locally. Hence the, the document they put together. And this is it. They put together um, their aspirations for York. And then what happened is after we were appointed and they put that, to, well, we were in the middle of pointing that, putting that together and there were local elections. Um, and, you know, wonderfully the, for us, um, the Green Party had uh, some success and suddenly the two Green Party members were appointed members in charge of both housing and transport. Happy days. So they came in and said, look, you know, these are lovely warm words in the document, but we're going to kind of see your Goldsmith Street and raise it. We want not only Passive House, but we want you to see if you can affordably deliver net zero carbon in operation. And also, would you measure your embodied carbon in construction? Well, I don't know how many of you are architects or how many of you are working out there in... Um, in the building industry, but whilst the government talk the talk about a low carbon future, we don't know of many clients who are actually trying to do it. Um, so this is remarkable. That's our plan showing York and the dots show where we are in the city. So we're all within the city of York, but there's only one within the city walls. Um, I'm not going to say too much about them. This is uh, lots of the themes I've already talked about, such as shared 
uh, landscape space, um, front doors for everyone, um, terrace houses wherever possible facing south. You know, all these themes are kind of reinterpreted with a slightly different um, architectural language, which we felt was more York. We're trying to avoid, interestingly, with timber frame construction, we're now trying to avoid any brick which is held up by steel um, at first floor because that becomes a massive issue, coal bridging. You can get over it, and we did at Goldsmith Street, but it took you know, an inordinate amount of detailing time. Um, so wherever possible, you know, where brick goes above, you know, it needs to be held up, we tend to try and use things which you can hang off the timber frame. Um, so I'm just going to talk about probably the jewel in the crown of that York series. It's called Ordnance Lane. It's in for planning now. Um, the other two I showed you are, have just been tendered and we're about to start on site. So this is about making a, a neighbourhood. Um, it's got great kind of vitality. It's right in the middle of the city. Um, it's got a great existing building here called the Married Quarters, which is um, uh, the remnants of when the site was used by the military. And we're going to be refurbishing that to, um, to, to, well, to passive house standards, which is incredibly difficult. Um, but it's a cyclable, walkable neighbourhood, again, with the same principles of... Um, passive house are assumed, but now we're in trying to achieve net zero carbon, using passive house really helps us do it affordably. Facing everything south and having a big form factor with terraces also helps us do it affordably. Um, also now providing the kind of roof space where we can get PVs on sufficiently to you know, square the circle and get net zero. That's the site plan. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to talk about that. We're going to run out of time otherwise. Um, much grander shared space. So instead of 14 metres separation, we're talking about 20. Um, and interestingly, the client had some great ideas about intergenerational living. So um, this typology on the end is a type we developed with them where the ground floor flat is separate but from uh, a duplex, family duplex above it, but they have an inter interconnecting door at the ground floor. So you can imagine two generations of the same family living within the same building and having as much privacy or, or, or not as they wish. Um, this is the existing building we're refurbishing and turning into a cafe on the ground floor. And this is the scale of the shared spaces in the middle. So much, much... Um, grander than the Ginnels of Norwich. Opportunities for uh, shared growing and play. I'm not going to have time to talk about this, I'm afraid. went a bit over the top with this one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who put this together. Um, <laughs> Annalise now going to talk about um, Park Hill Phase 2 in Sheffield. Yeah, I'm going to... I don't know how long we've got. About 20 minutes. Oh, what, what, including discussion. I'll be very quick. Um, I want to talk about Park Hill because I think it's probably one of the most, I don't know, famous or infamous housing, um, council housing schemes in the UK, probably. Um, and we're doing phase two, and it's really exciting. People are moving in. Um, it's not quite finished. It's a phase handover, but people are living there, and it's due to be finished in June, although, let's say, let's say July. Um, and I, I was a student at Sheffield, so this project meant quite a lot to me. I really wanted to win it, because um, it's quite, always quite symbolic. Um, it's very visible over the station, but... It was, when I was a student, it was a kind of failing estate and it was symbolic of kind of the failures of modern ar architects to do housing. And I think um, it's, yeah, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. It's been a privilege to study it. It's, it's really bonkers. I can't even, I won't have time to tell you how mad the planning is of it. Um, 
but I'll just tell you a bit about it. But before, how do I go? Now? So um, we're doing phase two. It's it's uh, 200 flats and commercial space at the ground floor. The whole of Park Hill was a thousand homes. It was one of four um, housing schemes that was completed by Sheffield City Council. It was the first. Um, the next one was Hyde Park, which has been nearly all demolished. There's just a bit left, which is badly overclad. Um, then Kelvin Flats, and then Broomhall Flats, which was the last to be built, but the first to be knocked down. Um, and, you know, I think it's extraordinary that a council built 4,000 homes within 10 years of varying qualities. Um, but it's interesting, I think, in the kind of context of, of, of what we're trying to do now um, and the kind of question of how to do it. Uh, there's lots of interesting stories about how they, you know, they, they got the tenders back, they couldn't afford any contraction, they, they decided to do it themselves. Um, I could uh, go on and on about it. Um, but I think all of these projects were based on this idea of streets in the sky, where you lift the streets up away from the fast moving traffic, as everyone imagined. Um, and, and you have this um, kind of section where every third floor you've got a street and you either go into a flat and down. You either go down into a flat or into a flat and up. So there's a kind of weird language we have when we talk about this project. We talk about, you know, above street flats, below street flats. No, um, you don't, they, it's not kind of a normal way of talking about houses. <laughs> um, so, you know, this, this kind of, it was, Parker was the first of this idea. It, it, after Sheffield, it went to Hume, which is probably even more infamous. And, you know, we can see in London with Trellick Town, Bartholomew Town, Robin Hill Gardens, which was, um, were built 10 years later because initially this was seen to be a success. Um, and yeah, it, the streets in the sky were, you can see probably in photos, are very low, um, but they were designed for what people thought streets were about, which was delivering milk. Um, quite problematic spaces to deal with because they are essentially cold bridge through the whole. Um, building and also those problems with acoustics, hobnail boots, people going to work. There's, um, yeah, they're problematic spaces and probably not very successful and a challenge to deal with because there was no overlooking onto them. Um, but the site plan is really fascinating. I mean, it is incredibly quirky. It's made of these what we call flanks that curve around the hill. It, it's a flat roof and it starts at four stories and it ended up at 15. Um, with a flat roof and it's you can walk from one side to the other through the bridges and through the streets or you could um, But it's a very kind of in some ways pragmatic every time a flank turns from north to south the, the street changes size so the streets always at the north That's about the only logic I've managed to find in it um, and, and yeah, it, we thought when we did a competition, we were going to end up with about five or six flat types. We've ended up with 37 because of the kind of quirks of the whole planning, which we um, weren't aware of. <laughs> um, so Urban Splash took it over. It was listed in, I think, 1998, which certainly saved it from demolition. Um, and then they took it over and had a kind of rocky road to delivering phase one through the credit crunch. Um, and it was, it was shortlisted for the um, Sterling Prize, and it really kind of did a great job of reinventing it because it had such a bad reputation within the city, and probably with some people still does. Um, but when we, but phase two, when Irma Splash were kind of ready to do that, they held a competition, and I don't know if any people are architects and do competitions, but this was the best one we've ever been asked to do, I think, because they gave us two weeks, which is brilliant because you can't do much in two weeks and a flat and they, they said the interview was to invite them into the flat and show them what we could do with the flat and that was it the brief was um, we want to know you're committed and can live and breathe the building and that was about it um, so we had this derelict building to wander around for two weeks and and I kind of thought long and hard about what we could do in this flat, which was at, covered in kind of pigeon poo, and it was it was disgusting. Um, so we, but as we walked around, I think we started to notice things which we wouldn't have noticed unless we'd been given this opportunity, which was the things people had done to the building to make it into their home, kind of the traces of inhabitation, and um, 
a lot of people had painted their balconies different colours. Um, and we kind of wondered why they'd done that. Did they not like the brick or did they just want to be able to see it from the outside? And this was, this was our balcony of our flat. Someone had kind of painstakingly painted the mortar joints in red. And so, so it's kind of curious. We, we will never know the answer really why people did, wanted to do this. But it became something that we were quite inspired by. Um, uh, that's a quote from Raina Bannum. I mean, talking about when it was built, one of the criticisms is you couldn't, you couldn't see the dwellings within the whole of the building that um, at the time that the idea was taking terrace streets up. But terrace streets have a very particular rhythm and you can see a house. So it's a bit academic, but you know, it was, we used it as, that, that is effectively our, um, uh, our interview, uh, you can see there. Um, so we started to think about what might happen if we, if we used a kind of rendered insulation to, to cover up a lot of the exposed concrete and try and kind of insulate it better externally, but also made it so that you could, you could actually see your flat from the outside, that every flat had this, had, it had a colour and you could associate um, with it. And I think because phase one was so colourful, we kind of felt obliged to ha have colour on our face, <laughs> although it's kind of something we normally shy away from using colours. Um, That's not true. <laughs> well, th to this extent. And to be <laughs> honest, it was a conversation that ran and ran and ran with historic England. We didn't really kind of anticipate the amount of interest in colours there'd be over the period of the project. Anyway, we have colours now. Um, they're chosen and they're up there. Um, but we also did this model at the time to look at what it might be like to live with colour in this, your, your home. Was it going to be okay? Um, so this was our entry. We, did a, we decided we weren't going to try and clean the flat. We were just going to put graffiti on because it's got a history of graffiti. And that seemed to be the easy thing to do. So we had four hours to do our, um, to do our competition entry. So we did this freeze. And, and the idea was from the front, it looks like Park Hill. You know, it's cleaned up and it's, but really we want to try and keep as much of the original fabric as possible. And then as you turn the corner, you start to see the, the homes in the colours. Um, and then we also did these, um, these big uh, kind of drawings about what the new spaces we were providing would be like. And um, I think this, when we, I think this is the thing that won us the competition when we managed to get Pooh and Piglet and Tigger in bed together, and we made the jury laugh. I think we thought, oh, maybe we've won it. Uh, by the way, we didn't put that. This was a children's bedroom. They said they, they thought we brought the stickers with us, and they were just there. But it's, it's, uh, it was you know, amazing how you could find all these rooms with the kind of, you just wondered about who'd, who'd use them. And I think another thing was the, the, there are these little precast concrete um, thresholds outside the front doors and everyone had put um, lino on them and that was the kind of thing that Ivor Smith remarked when when he what and that everyone had a different color lino and we wondered whether you know what, what lino was there we did a kind of a lino survey and looked at all the kind of seven, 60s and 70s patterns and kind of reinterpret well used the patterns and made them into doormats but extended them a bit further so people had more defensible space and did kind of trials in rubber crumb and um, ended up with a kind of um, combination of colour and doormat that made every single door um, unique so everyone has their own front door because of the different combinations which was a bit of a feat to work out to be honest um, and and what's great about having an existing building is you can just do mock-ups in it and try things out um, so, oops, it's not working. That's weird. And also we made a kind of model where we could just try out different colors on the facades as well. Um, and, and also we used the building and painted loads of colors on it. Most of them looked horrible actually. Um, <laughs> But it was quite a good kind of process to stand back and go, oh, actually, no, not that one. Um, we tried pinks and all sorts, and they looked terrible. Um, and actually, what we've ended up with is, um, is a kind of mix of colours that actually make the brick stand out, so they complement the brick. And it's really like our original 
kind of um, uh, image that we'd done for the competition. So it was a yeah, combination of blues and greens, really kind of taking colours from the landscape and the sky through it so that the brick panels read clearly. And the brick, we've, we've just cleaned it really lightly and kept the pointing. The pointing was in really good condition. So I think we, what we've tried to do is keep as much of the building as possible and just really light touch, clean it, repair it, maybe acoustically insulate it. So we've, you know, we've kept party walls and we've just added, added insulation on either side. Um, and you know, I think the, I think the bricks in surprisingly come out really well because it was so grimy. Um, it was a bit of a risk, I thought. And that's the street with the doormats. And at night, we've we've lit the lit the coloured reveals, and that lights the doormats. Um, and that's it. That's very quick. Park Hill, <laughs> which is good because I could talk about this project for a long time. Um, and I suppose it's worth saying that in the context of it being originally council housing, um, the deal with Sheffield City Council was 20% um, is now going to be affordable rent in this and the rest is going to be for private sale, generally across the whole estate, because the kind of cost and care required to repair and upgrade a building that is a kind of concrete frame is, is, is a lot of money. Um, so that's maybe where I'll leave that. Um, thank you so much, David and Anna Lee, for that really insightful presentation. I think the whole audience will be in agreement with me that that was just such an inspiring look at social housing and really understanding the language of social housing as well and how um, you know the, the human need is considered. So thank you so much. That was just really fantastic. Um, although Rowan could not be here, he did kindly send over a couple of questions, which I will um, ask now. Um, so the first one, um, with Park Hill, uh, you saw the scale at which the public sector delivered social housing in the 1960s. Do you believe that this is achievable now? And if so, how? <laughs> oh, it's all about money, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. um, it's, I'm sure it could be. I don't see why not. I mean, technology is better now than it was then. So the question is, is there the political will to do it? Um, obviously not. Because nobody's doing it. I mean, councils are trying to do it, but they end up like Park Hill, <laughs> cross-subsidising social housing with market sale housing on the same site. Um, so even York, whose ambition is, you know, huge, are unlikely to be providing more than 50% combination affordable and social. And even that's really ambitious. So the financial levers that are in place for local authorities to do this kind of work just aren't there anymore. And that has to have been a serious sequence of political decisions that have been taken in our lifetime, um, starting, I guess, with Margaret Thatcher etc so you know we are where we are now that's not to say it can't change but the political landscape has to change mm. so we aren't in control of that all we can do is do the very best work we can with the clients and the money we've got but you know you can't help but look at um ex you know projects we've had experience of like brentford Emily, i'm thinking of where again a really good developer doing really lovely work in Brentford. Um, we were one of three architects, Doug and Morris and KCA were the others. Um, and it, even though they were all selling off plan, it just wasn't in their interest to develop the whole thing out at the same time because they'd flood the mar their own market, you know. So the kind of mechanism for the private sector to provide that number of houses that quickly just ain't there. Mm. So that's why the public sector has a, if, if there's a crisis in housing, I believe the public sector is the way to solve it for that reason. I can't see an alternative unless somebody can tell me one way. Mm. 
I don't know. I'm not a politician or a financier, but that's just what we've witnessed from working with developers. Okay, very interesting. And do you think that's something that's going to, there's a possibility for change or it's, it's <laughs> anyone's guess? <laughs> No, it, it would need to be a priority, wouldn't it? Mm. it would need, you know, it council would, housing would need to be a priority. Would, and at the moment, there's more being sold off than can be built with the mechanism. So Norwich was, you know, part funded by right to buy receipts. I mean, so they're, were, they're losing more housing to right to buy than they could possibly build. So they have a huge stock of social social housing, but you know doing Goldsmith Street really when you look at the total picture <laughs> is um, yeah it's it's just not competing with they can't compete with people buying property especially as property values rise yes so you know many people call for an end to the right to buy and I'm sure that would help but I think it needs much more than that it needs a, a, a it needs well first of all there's that okay so somebody needs to change the political levers and that's a political decision, not for us. But um, the other thing I would say is, I think that whilst Norwich is 100% socially rented, um, I think a lot of people feel that that's quite a homogenous kind of community you're making. Mm. Um, so I think they're in York, they're, they're not in any way disheartened by the fact that it's 50% affordable. I think lots of projects like York doing infill, 50% affordable, 50% for sale could work really well. Could you mimic, how many thousand was it? 2,000 homes in Park Hill? Park Hill's 1,000. 1,000. Okay. Could you mimic that? Um, would you want to mimic it in one building? Um, I don't know, Annie, what do you think? Would you fancy that as a gig? I, well, I, obviously, I love Park Hill, but, I mean, it's... Uh... It's actually weirdly not very dense, and it's, I, d I don't quite know the density, but I don't know, could we be Park Hill again? I mean, I do look at it and think that I'd be really curious as to how, if it was built slightly differently, it could, it could get to, say, passive house standards and, and be up. So we're, we've um, upgraded it, but it's better, it will be better than building regs, but because of the low floor to ceiling heights, it will never be the kind of standards of passive house. It would need to be done differently. Um, and also, there's all sorts of regulations that we need to think about now that wouldn't make it possible, like, you know, part M, every, every flat has a staircase. Um, With no toilet on the, on the entrance floor. Well, some, one, some of them, you just go down the staircase yeah. into your flat. So, yeah, it, yeah there's, there's a lot of reasons you wouldn't be able to build it, that kind of typology anymore, I don't think. Mm. It's a lot of food for thought. <laughs> um, are there smarter ways uh, to meet housing, the housing need at a large scale? Um, are your York projects showing a different way to approach this? Yeah, they are, because it's more about placemaking individual places. But having said that, you know, it's expensive compared to you know, taking one building and one project, you know, so delivering against a budget is is harder when you're kind of atomizing it into like five, five or six projects. Mm. Um, and even then, we're only talking about 600 homes in York. You know, it's not a thousand. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly... An I think it's an intelligent way of building housing. Mm. And with the, the passive house scheme in particular, is that something that's been adopted by a lot of architects working on housing, social housing developments, or would you see it as something that's a bit more unique? A lot of our um, peers are, yeah, being asked to design housing to passive house okay. standards, not necessarily certification. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference. So you can design it to that standard, but whether it gets built to that standard or not is anybody's guess. Okay. So the difference between standards and certification is potentially huge. I should probably stress that because 
Um, yeah. Having said that, yeah, a lot of architects we know are now looking at it um, and probably as kind of anxious as I was when we started. Um, yeah, I don't see it massively influencing their master plans, though. Okay. You know, we don't see many master planning. We're often asked to look at master plans and rethink them for people because the master planner or the architect hadn't really taken the southerly orientation very seriously. Mm. Hadn't prioritised it, perhaps, over placemaking issues. Um, hadn't found solutions to the placemaking to make sure you could still do southerly orientated buildings. Um, so we're often struggling with that conflict when we're looking at bigger sites, you know, because it's never, it's, it's, it's unusual to find a site which lends itself as readily as Goldsmith Street did to a southerly aspect. Um, so I just think it's a lens that we tend to look through that other architects still don't. Mm. So we're collaborating on lots of projects with other architects and they're not coming forward with the same kind of solutions we would. I think it would be fair to say that it doesn't prevent you doing other orientations. It just the more you veer away from the south, the more expensive it becomes to meet that performance criteria. Okay. Because if you're facing east-west, you need external blinds because it's the only way to shade. Yes. The more we, we've we've done quite a lot of research into kind of say rotating Goldsmith Street and seeing the impact um, to try and get that kind of standard affordable. Um, and it's, it's the best way to achieve it for local authorities, really, um, and make it affordable for them. Great. Yeah, I think that's a big message for any architects out there. If you're, if you're working on housing, you know, and you want to do it affordably, you've really got to try and think about facing things south, giving them a good form factor. Um, simple as that. Everything else needs to follow after it. Great, thank you. So I'm happy now to open the floor to questions. Um, can... Yeah, oh, sorry. Just a quick short in passing that it looked from your presentation that Clayfield in Suffolk in 2005 didn't have any photovoltaics, no. which to my mind would be one thing that you would think about putting photovoltaics or anything you possibly could these days mm. um, and by 2009 you were doing it in Norwich sorry I'm not sure if you were doing it no we weren't and it was York where you were doing no. it in York we are yeah um, and what's your view of photovoltaics in the whole passage how sort of energy savings scenario um, we're, we're, to be honest, we're advised by experts that we work with as to what's the best thing to do. And um, at the moment, it's considered afford relatively affordable to use photovoltaics. When we were working on Norwich, we couldn't do passive house. We just no way could we afford passive house and photovoltaics. Um, so it's always a balance. Um, and actually, Norwich, you know, the client was uncomfortable about electricity being foisted on residents rather than gas. So Norwich, you know, if we did anything differently, it wouldn't be about the photovoltaics, it would be about not providing gas. Because um, that was the cheapest and the greenest at the time source of energy at the time. And I think we forget how things have changed. Have changed. Mm. And certainly for Clayfield, we were advised not to use anything like that because um, the, it was, the technology was considered not good enough um, and Bureau of Health were really clear. They were like, don't invest in windmills and, you know, just make really great fabric for the buildings and try and use passive solar gain. So, yeah. So lower technology, perhaps, uh, Clayfield, lower, lower level of technology, but I think appropriate to the time. You can always, you know, retrofit, retrofit that kind of thing. Do you think that position is changing with, or will change with the fuel crisis that we've got at the moment? I'm sure it will, yeah. I'm sure it, people are going to be more cognizant of energy, aren't they? I mean, fuel, yeah. It, the, the, initially, it was fuel poverty that was kind of driving our desire for to make um, a passive solar scheme in, in, Norwich. in Norwich, which which now seems to be something that's really 
quite urgent. And, you know, we're doing, going to be doing a big post-occupancy analysis um, this summer, but kind of reports back how people barely need their heating on all year round, so, and their fuel bills are incredibly low. There was a BBC uh, interview with some of the residents over the summer, uh, over the winter, when the fuel crisis started hitting the news, which was really nice to see. They were thrilled to be interviewed about their slightly smug, <laughs> um, slightly smug about their, their lovely council homes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Can you hear me? David Anders, what a fantastic set of beautiful projects. And you, the influence that these projects have now is, is amazing. But I'm just reflecting on uh, the thanks we have to give kind of to Bill Dunster and Bedzet because I remember going down there when it was under construction and getting a tape measure out, measuring the thickness of the walls, which were 420 millimeters, and mm. thinking, this is insane. Yeah. And Bill said, oh, you know, you just wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that whole, you know, it seemed to me that there was kind of a little light shining somewhere in the darkness 20 years ago, but nobody picked it up. And I just wondered if you had any observations about um, some of the work that was being, you know, that was being pioneered by Bill Dunster um, at the millennium. Yeah. Sorry, I'm behind this bloody great column. Yeah, but really, really, Bill Dunster is very influential. Um. I, I we went, we were went on a quite a detailed tour. Um, I think what we were really interested in with Clayfield, which wasn't so high-tech, it was a much simpler scheme, and wasn't going to perform as well as Bed said, and we knew that, um, was, was all about the kind of human behaviour that w resulted from certain, certain ways they approached people, the knowledge of pe what energy people used. And that certainly was quite kind of influential in, in, in looking at how you do a post-occupancy analysis. Do, do, you, do you shame people or do you reward people? And they'd had all that experience of, mm. of publishing, you know, having kind of the top energy, the best, you know, performing buildings. And um, it's really fascinating. And it's, yeah, I, I'm, I think he was definitely, he was very influential, but mm. I do wonder why why it wasn't more kind of um, wide, widespread. Why there wasn't Beds. more uptake. Yeah, I do. Um, so I remember at the time of Bedford came out, it was, you know, lauded as um, kind of worthy, interesting, and it, and it got, you know, a great deal of repute. But I don't know what happened to Bill's work after that. I mean, he started doing um, the Z really interesting, factory, yeah, the Z factory Which, and stuff. But um, do you know? Do you, are you are you a friend of his? Well, not by us, <laughs> not by us. No, not by you. We, we, we took up the kind of southerly orientation, the solar idea, um, but in a slightly different way, I guess. Every, sure. every architect's going to interpret those parameters differently, aren't they? I think we were interested in, maybe the difference between Bill's work and ours was that we were interested in an almost invisible sustainability, uh, a kind of a gentle ecology, somebody called it, which I quite liked that you know, it wouldn't be noticeable that these buildings were you know, kind of cleverly sustainable. 
you know, and we weren't looking to express that sustainability. We were like, we were hoping that actually it would be just background and that the buildings would be valued for other reasons. I guess that's the difference, I, I think. If you're looking for us to, to try and highlight what it might be, um, partially because we couldn't afford... Mind you, no one really we, took any we notes couldn't of afford, our No, nobody either. took any notes of our projects, but <laughs> no, we, we wouldn't have wanted to spend the client's money, say, on those, I think, really gorgeous, but those quite noticeably look-at-me rotating coloured cowls. For instance, I think they're lovely and they're a great thing, but we wouldn't. We it's just not the way we would have worked. I would have wanted to spend the money on a local lime wash render. Say, so, I mean, it's just a slightly different perspective, isn't it? But um, I think you're absolutely right that he was very incredibly influential on us and many others. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the marvelous talk. Um, uh, this question is about form factor and compact buildings. Um, the gentle density you presented had a form efficiency with curves and monopitch roofs and rhythm derived from its density. At higher density though, flatted accommodation, working with form factor can mean no inset balconies due to cold bridging concerns, box extrusion, matchboxes, basically. Mm. What are your thoughts on how to work at higher, de higher, not so gentle density with passive house, and how would you hack those constraints as you did with Is Goldsmith? He, isn't it easier at higher density? Isn't it easier at higher density? Because I know what you're saying about inset balconies, they're a massive problem. Um, any balcony that sits on top of accommodation is a problem. Any, any door that is inset say an entrance door which is inset, the soffit is a massive problem. And it's not just about the form factor, it's actually about the detailing of air tightness as well. So in, your, in Goldsmith Street, we, des we designed out, say, the porch problem by making sure they all stuck out. Um, I think I know exactly what you're saying because, um, and, and when we had to do Passive House, there was a, there was a kind of moment of grieving for some things that we thought were really important yeah it was true, and yeah, one of them yeah. i remember was we wanted a kind of big sliding door onto the garden and the threshold is is a really problematic area in the calculation of the pass program we just couldn't do it they were like you can only have one external door in the whole building door. and we were like and that's it and i think when you're kind of you're trained to think, you know, for that, certainly the era I was at university, it was all like glass and, and, and you kind of, it's, you, yeah, I remember just thinking, oh no, this is just awful. We're having to do, but I, so I completely know what you mean. We, we have to think differently. And I do think mm. that rather, that, that things will look different. Things are going to have to look different. But we're going to have to evolve a, a lang an architectural language which works with that stuff and still makes beautiful buildings. And I don't know what the solution is to your in, 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 e in e balconies. Just can't do um, it. It's something else. Do something else. But what is that thing? So instead of the kind of grief I felt doing it, mm. I, I do think we, we need to just accept that things are going to have to be a bit differently and things are going to have to look differently than we've been trained and learned to appreciate. And what is that thing? I mean, we've done one version of it. Mm. Um, I always wonder why the Park Hill it is a solar scheme. What would it be if it was Passive House? It would be different because the inset street would be different. But I am always kind of wondering what would that building be? Because so, yeah, I just think that's it. We're going to have to throw away those ideas of what's the fast way so i don't know what what do we study at university the kind of um yeah just and and what is this they're all cliches anyway <laughs> you know that's the great thing it's 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 you know the, the acres of glass with the panoramic view it's a massive cliche well so, we've got windows now but you know i'm just i'm being provocative but you know i think you're so right about grieving though, Emily. i remember i know 
Yeah. Well, grief comes in seven stages, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. then we, we did win the Sterling Prize and it's only got one door and some windows. So, you know, maybe it wasn't so bad. Mm. Um, it looks okay. And, mm. you know, I just think we've got to accept this and see what it can give us rather than being upset about what we've lost. Well, I think we might have to just wrap up there a little mm. bit over mm. time. But um, once again, thank you so much for such a fascinating presentation and answering all of our questions. And it was just a pleasure to have you here. You're so welcome. from all of us, thank you. Thank you.